a celebration. Hallelujah. We come to lift the Savior up. Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise for the people. Sing a song to the Lord. Of his goodness and his mercy. Make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. All the people sing a song. Sing a song to the Lord. Of His goodness and His mercy. Of His goodness and His mercy. Of His faithfulness and His love. Amen. <laughs> amen and amen. Praise God for worship this morning. And it's so good to, to see you, David and Linda and Reba and Andrea. Let's go ahead and see what our praise reports are and our prayer 
requests. Praise reports. Yeah, Linda. Um, a home from the hospital. My my. <laughs> Praise. They have scheduled me for physical or I, I forget the other one. Um, the the personal one, therapy. At eleven o'clock, nobody's here but me. So I don't know how much a Bible study I can get in. I I got I you. Just, I, just like Greg's been singing, I can't stop praising the Lord. I things are going so well after after all those little weird things that happened. But I'm on my almost on my feet, and all I have to do is a whole lot more work. <laughs> Well, amen. Amen, Linda. Well, we praise God for the praise report and we praise God for you being home. Amen. All right. Any other praise reports? Any other praise reports? All right. Any other prayer requests? Any other prayer requests? I want to, I'll lift up um, Lewis. I believe he is traveling to um, New York, um, Buffalo. May He may be, actually, he should be there by now. Um, but we pray that uh, his travel there and back are filled with God's grace and mercy and uh, uh, traveling protection. And Reba, I see you came off mute. Oh, I was talking before. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can oh, you hear me? Now I can. Yeah. I, I had to go change the same system or something. I'm having I'm having time with this Zoom, but here I am. <laughs> there praise you go. God. And I do praise God for travel mercies for so many people that have been on the highways and byways this past week. And um I do want to lift up Sister Margaret Wright. She's uh, at Mount Vernon Emergency Room now, and I think they're going to take her over to Virginia Hospital Center. I went over there and visited with her. I think Greg was there last night, and she just needs some some medicine and maybe um, some antibiotics and stuff, and hopefully she will be okay. Oh, so I think God. Lewis is going up to uh, Buffalo for her twin sister's birthday. Their birthday is on uh, the 29th. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so I don't know. I've got to ask him how long he's staying, but uh, he's there. All right, any others? Any others? Okay, let's pray. God, we say thank you for 11 11, 11 minutes past the 11 o'clock hour on the 26th day of the fourth month in the year 2023, where you've given us breath inside these mortal bodies that we might continue the transformation of our souls such that we might be the instruments that you intended us to be as you transform matter in all that is in this world. We thank you for using us as instruments of your divine plan. We thank you for somehow knowing that this is beyond even our capacity to comprehend the blessing as you have taken the macro, took the macrocosm and put it in the microcosm. You've taken your spirit that has no limits and given us a, <laughs> a portion of that to have life and to uh, increase life in the ways that you have designed us to learn and then share. We thank you in these bodies that we have uh, that come with praise and pain, uh, tests and testimonies, and yet you are at the end of every story. And so we praise you for Linda's return home. We praise you for at the end of the bumps, there is a paved road. We thank you, God, that in it all, <laughs> uh, if we look for it, we'll see your glory. We'll see the reason to lift you up. 
And so we say thank you. We thank you for traveling mercies for all of those who are traveling. And we lift up on this morning, Margaret, right? And pray that she will continue to um, receive the medication, receive the attention, receive the uh, next steps so that her mind, body, and soul can continue to heal. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, which allows us not to have to travel to Jerusalem, not to have to go to Bethlehem, not to have to go to Nazareth, but to open our mouths and you are there. And may your Holy Spirit lead us into the chapter of John, where we see Jesus' priestly prayer, and that we might be instruments in the hands of a God that has called us on purpose. Illuminate our understanding so that we might even continue our transformation on this day. It's in Christ's name that we pray and say together, amen. Amen. All right, well, friends, I am uh, just elated in my spirit in this 17th chapter of John. And I, John is one of the gospels, or my favorite gospel, I, I, I must admit, uh, because he gives so much room for the expansion of our understanding of who God is. And in this chapter, the 17th chapter, we're going to see that John, uh, <laughs> I love this chapter, um, is going to tell us what Jesus said uh, is eternal life, and it gives us a whole different understanding of where we normally gravitate or where we normally think when we think of eternal life, and therefore gives us a roadmap on how to live uh, in eternal life, even in the midst of mortal uh, bodies, that we don't have to wait until the body uh, is laid down to gain access to the knowledge, to gain access to the experience, to gain access to the purpose for which we have been called. And Dr. Evans breaks that down uh, quite well for us to understand. And so for those that are um, visual learners as well as auditory learners. We will put this in the chat and share what uh, our hope is for this session. And that is uh, when we are unified. Yeah, man, it is good this morning. I pray uh, one, of, one of the challenges I've got, David, is um, the Lord will show me something. And I uh, always feel so inadequate to then verbalize it because the showing is beyond words. But I pray that he will uh, continue to illuminate uh, my capacity to articulate what he's shown me in this text for Sunday, because this is where we're going Sunday. But the main idea is that when we are unified with God and others, always across unity vertically with God, right? And everybody's got a cross. If, if you if you just unify with God, then uh, you got a stick. You ain't got a cross. <laughs> uh, but vertically and then horizontally, that's with God and others. Then, 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 then Jesus exp explains that this is where we experience the joy that Jesus prayed for. It's joy not based on the world, and uh, we're going to hear um, Dr. Evans gives a very short, succinct definition of what Jesus says means when he says the world. Uh, basically, the world is when a person, place, or thing is operating outside the grace, goodness, and presence of God. He says it a little bit more succinctly. Um, but the world is where God has called us to influence. Where God is not, uh, we're called to uh, to be. And in just chapter 17, we're going to see that Jesus isn't praying that the disciples are taken out of the world. No, uh, he's not praying for them to be taken out of the world. The very fact that we are breathing is we were sent to the world. 
and those who have been given the awareness of God's presence of this other world, if you will, um, have been called to influence this physical world with the presence of God. And so he's saying, I'm not praying that you take them out, but I'm that you take them out of the world, but I'm praying that you protect them so that they can complete the work that God has sent for them to do. And he's going to uh, lift up that his time has come. He says, my hour has come. And when he says his hour has come, it's a reference to he has knowledge that what he was sent to do has been accomplished. So he knows that his time is limited. And so this unity over, 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 over and over again, uh, Jesus in this 17th chapter is going to talk about how unity is what success looks like, right? Unity is what success looks like. And we're going to talk about that from a, uh, we're going to start with the person and then the family, then the extended family about what unity looks like and what it doesn't look like and how we can move towards unity and greater unity in every instance. So in the heart, we want to feel motivated to what? Build unity in the church. Yeah, we'll be lifting up that. Before we can build unity in the church, we've got to build unity within ourselves. I would argue that we are all splintered to some extent. Um, there is the splintering mean, there is the um, uh, fight against uh, doing what God calls us to do and knowing what God calls us to know at sometimes uh, having a counterbalance that uh, our worldly nature, what we've been taught and is a part of our physical DNA that, we, that we're called to transform, but sometimes that speaks louder and so we're splintered. And uh, in our splintering, each day is a call to unity. Um, and if we can understand that the first call to unity is within ourselves, uh, then we will increase our capacity to illuminate light from ourselves and uh, to one another. Then there's the life change to heal the divisions in the church so that they might glorify God and experience more of his presence. And again, uh, he doesn't get into this. Uh, but I'm certainly going to get into it around uh, understanding uh, how unity starts within our spirit, right? And I would dare say that when your spirit is disturbed, it is God saying, okay, here comes the test. Here's a learning opportunity. Um, I've called you here uh, on this planet Earth so that your soul might be sanctified and transformed and uh, doing that in conjunction with your other brothers and sisters. <laughs> yeah. So that is where we are headed uh, this, this morning. This is such a uh, key place to where the church is now, where we're called uh, to go as God is reforming the church. So um, let me just ask a couple questions. Think of your best friend or spouse, in what ways are you completely different from one another? All right, who wants to, who wants to take a, uh, <laughs> who wants to go first? We'll, we'll, we'll hear from at least two. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm laughing because well, I know sometimes opposites attract. And I'm uh, thinking about the differences between me and Candace, but I'm trying to give now, 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 you be a wordsmith, right? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I tell you what, I'm gonna make it easy on, on you. I, I'll say one thing and then that'll get us rolling. Um, so one way that Candace and I are completely different is um, Candace 
amongst her close friends and to me, loves to talk, right? Uh, she's uh, more of an extrovert and uh, I like to listen um, more than I like to talk. Um, and that combination, uh, when we work that together in its right way, right, can be very fruitful. Um, but if I'm not uh, paying attention to the blessing of the difference, um, then it can be problematic, right? All right, I started off. Come on, there, yeah. <laughs> so I said, I ain't saying nothing. <laughs> uh, I jumped in with it. What a little. I'll, I'll pick on my spouse. Um, I um. I, I think I'm more contemplative than he is when it comes to purchases. Okay. He just sees something and buys it. Miss it something that we don't have something. He just gets it. I want to think about it. I want to look at the reviews. I want to look at the, you know, uh, consumer reports. And, and I also use something until it's ragged and on its last leg and patched together, you know, <laughs> and he's like, Oh, that's a chip. Pick. Get another one. <laughs> Oh, you know, I think it, it's a blessing in a way because there's a lot of things where he's looking at me he's like, why don't you just buy a new one? You know, I'm I'm hobbling some broken piece of thing together or something. He's like, like you could just get another one. I've re-sewed that hammer seam in my pants nine times. He's like, just go get a new pair. Oh, <laughs> uh, so it's a good balance, you know. But then, it, then again, I'm like, you know, well, it's this brand and that brand, and we get this and we get that and. You know, uh, he does listen to that too. So that's one way we're different. I'm not the spender, he is. <laughs> All right, that's excellent. I I'm going to move us into the same question. And uh, Reba kind of put us in that, uh, in the answer of this one as well. What do you appreciate about a difference between you and your spouse? And Reba just gave that same answer. Um, and I'll answer in Candace talking. Uh, what I appreciate about Candace in her talking is it lets you know where a person is uh, because talking is one of the basic ways that we communicate. Um, we don't we don't have the capacity to read people's mind. And without that uh, larger conversation, we can interpret things less effectively. And uh, when I remind myself that, hey, I'm going to hear something that I would, that I didn't know, um, I'm more patient than my mind kind of, my mind wants you to just get to the point, right? Um, just give me the facts and I'm good, right? But she's taught me that there's more to it than just the facts. Um, and that is the spirit behind uh, how someone said or did something and how she received it and, and or responded and how God is calling me in that moment to, to learn. So that's one. Uh, anyone else? What, what do you appreciate about a difference? Well, you know, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, David. Your last comment just made me think that the same conversation that I may have with my wife over the phone is a different conversation if I have the exact same conversation face to face. Because sure, talking is our main, you know, uh, avenue of communication. However, what you say with your face and your body and your expressions uh, does communicate a lot as well. So, you know, if you're, if, if we're having a conversation and I'm not just hearing what you're saying through your mouth, I'm hearing what you're saying through your body. But uh, I wasn't going to, my wife is bouncing in and out, so she's not going to be the subject of your question. <laughs> I, well, well, see that, uh, that man. This I, I wish Candace was bouncing in and out because this I could get some free points. Right? <laughs> uh, tell us this is about appreciation. 
these could be these could be plus points or negative points you know <laughs> yeah, bro, that's true that's true and, and and that's also true uh sometimes we think we're getting plus points and not, and not so much <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right but uh, I can't I can't spotlight a differences of a friend I have and that it's our time management. So we play music together and do different things. And uh, this guy, I can set my clock by him arriving on time. As a matter of fact, he, he gets there early. He thinks that if he's 15 minutes early, he's still late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Nice. And I'm and I'm not like that. So together, you know, we kind of blend. Um, and sometimes me coming late looks like I'm making an entry. It makes me look more like a star. So nice. It works. <laughs> and, and so let, let, let's think about that. Uh, when we think about uh, our closest friends, when we think about our spouses, our um, our relationships, um, there are a lot of differences and we have some differences with some of our friends uh, and spouses that are quite different, and yet they're not obstacles to our relationship. Why aren't the why aren't those differences obstacles to our relationship? Hmm. So there are, you're absolutely right. We have differences that sometimes complement the relationship. Uh, sometimes we tolerate, I guess. But there are differences with some uh, acquaintances that aren't tolerable. And um, you just can't live with. So yeah, you made me think about that. Uh, oh, well, before uh, before we go there, right, right. Uh, look. <laughs> I, I, I got a lens. I want you to stay in the lens, right? We're we going to get there in a minute. <laughs> but on, <laughs> this lens is the, the differences that we appreciate, right? That That's the lens. And looking at the differences that we appreciate, why aren't those differences obstacles, the ones that we appreciate? Um, and, and you you, you kind of uh, said the uh, the magic word. Well, for me, they seem to complement uh, each other uh, in some way or form. They certainly don't uh, take away or, or subtract. So either, you know, you coexist or you act it actually is a benefit. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I'm going to suggest, go ahead, Reba. I, I was going to say the same thing. You can kind of depend on people who are different from you to, to do the thing that you don't do so well. So, you know, uh, I, I I might be the clean freak and cleaning up everything, but I'm about to be cook. But, you know, you go ahead and cook and I'll clean and we, we get everything accomplished. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and, and a side note, we've got to watch ourselves in that. Uh, and I'm, this testimony for me, it's like uh, sometimes I've got to, you know that again that splintered that splinteredness um uh, if Candace cleans something up um there is uh and uh I'm looking for something that I set down someplace right uh there's a part of me that's grateful that it was cleaned up but then there's a part of me that said well now I can't find where where I put it right and I've got to remind myself if I had to put it where it should have been in the first place <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have to look for it. And so this, this is where we're going to lean into um, in looking at our differences first with those closest to us, because um, chances are way better than good, almost certain that when there's discord in a particular place or situation, God is calling us to learn something. Our um, natural knee jerk coming from our protective system is uh, to just try to fit the situation in our box and blame the other person because it doesn't fit in our box. And yet this whole uh, breathing, while we're breathing, while we're here right now, is to be transformed. And those are opportunities to um to expand 
uh, our transformation and uh, the reason why we have breath on this earth. You know, Pastor, that to go up, but um, it seems to me like the devil always wants to find a way to divide, like the divide and conquer, split apart, make everybody look at how how am I? You, you walk into the room like how am I different from everybody else? How is this one not like me? And then either you're exalting yourself above everybody else, or you're or you're putting yourself down above everybody else. But they they said when when the clouds roll back and the trumpet comes, they say, okay, we're taking the musically gifted first, then we'll get to the intelligent, then we'll get to the you know physically strong and able. No, everybody the same. It, it, every wow. everybody, you know, I'm saying like, like we've been studying the resurrection for two weeks, so <laughs> so uh, I'm just I'm just saying it doesn't it never it never says oh uh, when when I come back I'm gonna I'm gonna pick and choose different groups it just I'm pick everybody. Yeah, so, yeah. There's yeah, no, yeah. there's no way that you should. I don't even like to hear people put themselves down and say, "Well, I'm just too emotional all the time." You know, as that that's something I have to work on. No, that's just the way God, God made you. I wouldn't take somebody who was, uh, maybe had an obvious intellectual disability to pick something and say, "Oh, well, they need they need to work on that." Does that does that mean that they're going to get resurrected later than the rest of us? No, God is God is graceful to everyone. He spreads his grace on everybody. So there's no no reason to think that we should be ununified or, yeah, or put yeah. each other into different groups. Yeah. Let's put ourselves in a in a lower group. Yeah, I hope uh I, I hope um that um I need to start advertising that one of the trainings that I do is around that very th same thing. Both are false, elevating ourselves. And uh, uh, putting ourselves beneath others, both of those are um, illusions that the enemy causes us to lose track of what's important and why we're here. Um, and in this lesson, here's some of the things that uh, that's a good segue into this. Every person, you know, no matter how close you are to them is different from you. Yeah. Period, 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 period. Their personalities, their backgrounds, their interests, and talents make them unique. Yet friendships and marriages still form and thrive between diverse individuals. And here's the thing. Our distinctions are not divisive, but enriching. And I dare say that um, even in those areas where we have concluded that this is a... Uh, 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 area of, uh, of conflict, if we dig deeper, God shows us a deeper meaning um, in our ability to know him, which is a way different way as you describe in Reba, than we, our uh, brains normally operate. Um, this whole, <laughs> I don't wanna get ahead of myself, uh, let me just so so we can get to this text and get to the scripture. And so the church is supposed to act right uh, the same way, letting differences teach and inspire one another on to accomplish our purpose. And that and our what is our purpose? To shed the light on God, not to shed the light on somebody's mistakes, not to shed the light on uh, uh, a person's greatness, but to shed the light on God's greatness, to shed the light on um, uh, this eternal realm that God has given us to be in, even in mortal bodies. And so as we look at that as our purpose, uh, when we are unified, living in a community with one another, then, then, then we will reflect his light to the world. Okay, yeah. so let me get this out before I forget it, because you guys okay. All right. <laughs> made me think that, um, you know, the one that's closest to you, like your spouse, is almost the one that you abuse the most. And abuse is not the right word, but <clears throat> if you go out in the world on your journey or your daily activities and you get knocked down, you try to stand up or keep a good face in front of the public. But when you come home, that's when you break down or that's when you unload and you bring all this misery that you experience with you to your spouse. Yeah. And yeah. you just can't change at the front door, change your face and say, Hey, everything's okay. She knows, or your spouse knows 
what's going on with you. And vice versa, if you get a promotion, you know, you might shake his hand and say, that's great. But when you come home, you're jumping all over the house <laughs> and, and your wife is there with you. Yeah. So it's an interesting dynamic. So does that relationship move into the church? Because you're close to the church, your home church, but you treat, treat visitors differently. Uh, so I, I don't know how that, if that translates or if that, you know, uh, communicates the same way conveys, but uh, I do notice that about the home, and I noticed that years ago when I tried to uh, consciously, when I had a bad day, not make everybody in the house have the same bad day that I was having when I got back home. So, uh, and you guys just brought that flashback to me. It's like, hmm, why is that? And, and you know, it's, it's absolute, and uh, we typically, well, there, there's circles of influence and then there's circles of um, um, where we have the greatest capacity to influence. And um, it it's absolutely correct. When uh, those that are closest around us, we kind of take for granted we, because we know we can uh, let our guards down, so to speak. Um, and so often, uh, the ones that we love the most uh, often at times get the uh, short end of the stick when we're not feeling so well. One of the ahas and I, that, that I'll, uh, I'll mention on Sunday in the things that we need to do for our families is we need to create space. Um, and you, you're going to hear me talk about space all the time. Space around transitions. That means... If I'm coming from work, if I'm coming, doesn't if I'm coming from the store, when I'm getting ready to enter a new space, uh, to make sure my focus is on my mission here, right? And that's to glorify God. And my focus is not on what just happened if it doesn't glorify God, right? And so if I got in a argument, if I got in uh uh in traffic and I'm all whatever it is. Uh, before I enter the house, before I enter that space, before I make that call, have is it well with my soul, right? Is it well with my soul? So we often start out here. I want to go back in to saying it starts, unity starts within us, and then it spreads out. Um, and it spreads out mostly uh, to those that we love the most. And those are circles. There is the circle of family, of of family, then relatives, and then the church is like the next one, and then uh, it goes out from there. But here's the thing. Uh, just as you mentioned, David, it starts with those closest to us. You also identify where it starts first, and that's internally. The disconnect between worldly responses and the response to be on mission, to be on point, to glorify God starts inside. And if I can create space around my movement in the world, even around my movement and thought, um, is this glorifying God, right? Because there is the element of the one thing that God wants to change, right? Physical world, our minds, uh, into the transformation of knowing him, which we're going to find out knowing him is eternal life. Uh, that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. And if I can focus my attention, not on changing somebody else, but changing my division into unity, then, then, then this unity on every everything out starts to uh, increase. So let, let's go to John 17. Uh, let, did I did I did I lift that up? What's in the chat, real quick? Every person you know, no matter how close you are to them, is different from you. Personalities, background, interests, talents make them unique. Yet friendships and marriages still form and thrive because diverse individuals thrive between diverse individuals. Again, our distinctions are not divisive, but meant to be enriching, and we're supposed to be the same way. Uh, acting the same way, letting differences teach and inspire one another on to accomplish our purpose to glorify God. When we're unified, living in, in community together, that's when the light 
which is the only thing that can transform anything, that's when it's reflected the most. So I'm going to go to John 17. I'm going to put it on the screen, but also have it read. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to dive in here and then watch the video. See if it lets me. Okay. All right. Let's see. Do you see my scripture? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Here we go. John 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. John 18. Amen and amen. And so we're going to watch the session now. And here are the questions in, in uh, yellow that I want us to um, hear Dr. Evans reiterate. What is eternal life? Two, according to Dr. Evans, what is Satan's goal? And three, what is unity and why is it important in the church? We'll look at those three. Um, but let's now go to, let's go to 
the the video. I've got a my screen is doing something really weird here. Not sure. oh, I know what I gotta do. Okay, there we go. All right. Taking its own good time this morning. Let's see. Uh, all right. And finally, there we go. Right. Sorry for that delay. No worries. John 17, jam-packed with spiritual truth that is transformative in nature. It's Jesus' high priestly prayer. He speaks about himself, his father, you personally, and the whole church collectively. He starts off by telling us what eternal life is. It goes beyond a mere length of time. Everybody lives eternally. But he says in verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. Eternal life is the knowledge of God. In fact, eternity, our time in heaven with the Lord, will be the undisturbed, increasing knowledge of God. Since God is infinite and inexhaustible, all eternity will be filled with new information about him. But he doesn't want us to start that when we go to heaven because we receive eternal life the moment we come to Christ. So this is an ongoing process of discovering our great God. Like a baby in a womb has to go through a process that brings him in the life and a constant discovery on earth. We will be doing a constant discovery in eternity. And with this life, he wants us to glorify him. Over and over again, Jesus makes this, I glorified you on earth. How do you glorify God? Having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. You want to experience more of God? Then give him more glory. You want to give him more glory? Then accomplish the work he's given you to do. We have appliances in our homes. They've been created to give life to a purpose. Stoves cook, refrigerators cool or freeze, can openers open cans and toasters pop bread up. You know what they're doing? They are accomplishing the work they've been created to do. And the better they do the work, the more you can brag on the appliance. The more we glorify God, the more of God we experience because the more purpose we are fulfilling for which we are created. Fulfill your purpose, you give God more glory. Give God more glory, you experience more of God's life. And the knowledge of God's life is the experience of his reality operating into, with, and through us. So Jesus goes on in his prayer, and he goes on to pray that we are protected from the evil one. He says, I have given them your word. The world hates them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. 
His prayer is that Satan would not govern our lives. But in order for Satan not to govern our lives, we can't be people of the world. What does he mean by world? World is that system headed by Satan that leaves God out. Satan wants to keep God out of the equation and keep Jesus dormant in your life. You and I become worldly when God is not in the equation and affecting the decisions. The world of fashion, the world of, of politics, the world of finance, the world of sports, those are all worlds focused in on one subject. Worldliness is when God can no longer be part of the equation. He says, keep them from the evil one from making them worldly. Why? Because that'll block God. It'll keep God away. But he's not finished. In fact, he's just getting started. Over and over again, you'll see the word one. He says in verse 11, that they may be one. He says in verse 21, that they may be one. He says in verse 22, that they may be one, just as we are one. He summarizes it in verse 23, perfect them in unity. Let me try to explain, this is critical. There's one God, but the one God is composed of three co-equal persons. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, but the three make up the one Godhead. It's like a pretzel with three holes. First hole is not the second hole, the second hole is not the third hole, but they all tie together by the same dough. That is, every member of the Trinity possesses the divine nature. He says, make them one as we are one. Why is this oneness critical? Because God only expresses himself in unity. So if you were the devil and you didn't want God to show up, what would you do? Create disunity. So Satan's goal is creating disunity, racial disunity, gender disunity, political disunity, class disunity, social disunity, to keep God away. You know, one of the reasons we're not seeing God at work more in spite of worship services, church services, in spite of uh, you know, prayers being prayed because we're doing it disunified. This even applies to a family. First Peter 3, 7 says that if the husband and wife are disconnected, the prayers of the husband are hindered. So you can have family devotions and God not hear you because of the disunity. What do we mean by unity? What is oneness? What is unity? It's a shared purpose. When a football team gets on, a, on, the, uh, on the gridiron, there's only one goal line, but they're 11 different positions. But each position is headed toward the one purpose. What is our one purpose? Our one purpose is the glory of God. Will we advertise God with this decision or with this action, with this plan, or with this program? When Satan can come in and he can divide us, then he can block out the glory of God, which keeps God away. And if God is away, then we won't see his presence. That's why he says in verse 24 that he wants us to be one. Listen to this, verse 24, that they may see my glory, see me manifested. We're not seeing God manifested in his people and in his church because we've let the divisions of the world and the divisions of the culture define the church and create confusion. What God is after now is that Jesus Christ be the central piece of our unity and that glorifying him, which also glorifies the Father, as we are one, Ephesians 4, 3, preserve the unity of the faith. When we make unity a priority without compromising any, of course, of the fundamentals of the faith, when we decide that being one is more important than our preferences, then we will see a lot more of God. But as long as we don't participate in Jesus' prayer, he's praying this. We are the answers to this prayer. And if we don't participate in Jesus' prayer, we won't experience God's answer. This unity provides the key element 
to bring us together to see heaven drawn down in the history, eternity drawn down in the time, so that God's presence is manifested in your life, in your family, certainly in our churches, for the benefit of our society. God can turn things around, but he won't if we're misdefining him by illegitimizing him by illegitimate disunity. Disunity over sin, disunity over false doctrine, that's legitimate. But disunity over preferences or other things that are outside of the will of God will keep God away. This is the emulsifier. Emulsification is where things that are not together are brought together through a process. When I eat sandwiches, I like mayonnaise. But mayonnaise is made up of oil and water. And oil and water just don't get along. No matter how much you try to mix them, they're never going to get along until you introduce egg. Because what egg does is it grabs oil, it grabs water, and it brings the two together. Yes, we live in a culture and we live in relationships that break down and don't get along. But when we have the emulsification of the glory of God through the fulfilling of his purpose in unity, that will pull us together so that his manifest Shekinah glory, that means where he visibly shows up and shows off, will demonstrate itself that he is operating in the world. It's time to see more of God than we're seeing by answering Jesus' prayer personally, by fulfilling his purpose, and then collectively through our biblically-based unity so that the glory of God is being manifested in a world overruling Satan's goal of bringing spiritual defeat to his people. All right. Well, there is a lot there. So let's see if we can, uh, let me see if I can focus us in a progression of uh, all that we just heard. Um, let's just start with uh, John 17, um, one through four. Five, John 17, 1 through 5. Um, somebody read that for me one more time. You want me to read it out of regular Bible or are you going to put it up? Uh, either or. Here it is right up on the screen too. All right. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have given you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. All right. Uh, and as we look at this, oh, there's some of my notes. Uh, Jesus opened by saying the hour, that is, his purpose for coming to earth uh, was upon him. His purpose was to give eternal life, which in verse three, he describes as knowing the Father. And so how does Jesus' description of eternal life, knowing God, compare to how you have typically understood it? Um, let's start with that. How does Jesus says, uh, here, here's the overarching things. Jesus came that we might have eternal life. In that eternal life, our joy is complete. Eternal life, then he says, is this. Eternal life is knowing the only, only true God, right? It means there's a whole lot of gods out there, right? But the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. He says that's eternal life. How does that strike you? And how is that different than uh, 
we may hear often or we may have interpreted what eternal life is. What comes to mind? Hmm. Well, you know, I'm, I'm very limited when you say eternal life. Like you said, we're kind of men or kind of uh, fix it engineering type guys. So I look at the word life and I look at the word eternal. Um, life as we know it is living and breathing every day. That's our definition of life. But then you throw eternal in there and part of life is death. So eternal, our understanding of that word means forever, uh, infinity. So at a rudimentary, you know, layman's uh, definition is forever you'll live. Um, but we see people die regularly. So eternal life, I guess we always thought that you die, you go to heaven and you live in heaven for it. Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to break it down. Good way to break it down. Well, what would you say? What would you add, Reba? I agree with David. I I guess I always kind of had this image that eternal life was after you die here physically on earth, then you're resurrected to heaven and live forever there. But now I have a different understanding and it kind of backs it up a little bit. Like once we accept Christ and we die to sin, we're born again in a new life in Christ. And that in that life, we're being sanctified and sanctified as much as we study and learn and so we've already started eternal life and we've already started living. We might pass through the curtain of physical death here on earth, but we're just going to keep living um, and learning. In the yeah. in Amen. Amen. And so uh, the goal is, uh, and let me just reiterate what, what Reba said in that uh, once we accept Christ, and sometimes individual when they accept individuals when they everybody has a different experience and our experience is based on glorifying god right <laughs> it's the way we were designed some have uh a thought that tells them you know hey i'm going to try christ i'm going to give this you know try try this thing that i've been hearing in church um Others, uh, some folks have heard audible voices. Others have just felt that they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I'm ready to try something else. I might as well try Christ, right? Um, and at that point, there is something in the engineering, something in God's plan, something in God's science that there is... Uh, this new life that we have now become a part of. And so as one, uh, as our worldly, uh, that part of us that's tied to time and space, our bodies is decreasing. There is a part of us that now has been born again, right? And it, it will not see death. And in that extent, life mission is really, uh, the mission of life is to, to live, to start, is to really live before we die, um, to live in that eternal realm um, before we get to laying down our bodies. And if we can get to the understanding that we are now eternal beings, inside a shell, inside a transportation, in, inside some space, um, and yet uh, we continue when this physical matter discontinues and to start living that um, in the right here and now is, is our mission. And the way that we do that, oh, let me, before I get too far, let me, uh, let me put this in the chat. It, so if eternal life starts now, right? Once we've accepted Christ, and what what are your what are you currently doing to increase your knowledge of God? Let's see if we can come up with a list of things that we are doing and or could do. 
And in what ways has your knowledge of God increased since you first believed in Christ? Before we get to that second one, let, let's, uh, what are some of the things, let's make a list of things that we are doing or could do, right? That would increase our knowledge of oh, God. Now, again, let's back up. Why is it important to increase our knowledge of God? Why is that even important? Uh, well, I, and I, want, I want you to get uh, first, I, and I want the answer uh, to what Jesus said in seventeen three. What does he? What does Jesus? He tells us the reason why in ver, verse three, chapter seventeen, why we should increase our knowledge. It's, he says that's the definition of eternal life. <laughs> he said that's it. That's all, right? He said eternal life is knowing God and knowing Him. So if we want to receive eternal life, it hinges the capacity for us to receive it. If I do like if okay, if I hold my hands like this, I can receive so much water, right? If I go get a five gallon container, I can get, receive more water. Jesus is saying the container by which we receive eternal life is contingent upon our knowledge of God and him. That that is eternal life. So now with that as a background on the uh, knowing God and knowing Christ is eternal life. So what are ways that we can know him? And let's just brainstorm. Or what are things that we can exercise, right? Or do to increase our knowing of God and therefore increase our knowledge of eternal life and therefore increase our knowledge, we'll see later, of joy. What can we do? We can read, study scripture. Yep. Yeah. So primary uh, in uh, in in the body, there are what we call major muscle groups. And then there are uh, the additional muscle groups. Right. Um, and so as far as knowing God and knowing Jesus, therefore knowing eternal life, and therefore having the fullness of joy, not based on circumstance, but based on the revelation that uh, we're eternal beings. We can read and study. Uh, yep. Uh, so our, our ability to read and study uh, and the amount of time that we put into that. What else? What else would you put there? Associate with others who are doing the same? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Association. Yeah, yeah. Iron shock and Yeah, 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 yeah. What else? What else? Pray for wisdom and discernment, knowledge. Yeah. I want to say repetition. You 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 mentioned muscle groups and muscle memory, and you develop that by repetition. Yeah, 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 yeah. How would we articulate? Um, um, we're reading, we're studying in association because yes, iron sharpens iron. Um, repetition right we know that uh even in, in the manifestation of the physical world repetition builds discipline and dis discipline leads to something right um it needs leads to it leads to memory <laughs> right um so how would we describe application Could you say testifying? Because the more you tell people about the goodness of God, the more you hear it yourself. Uh, yeah. 
So, so it, in 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 uh, application is definitely testifying, right? Which also lends ourselves to what repetition? <laughs> yeah. Well, I had, a, I had a friend that would testify about something over and over again, and um, um, I remember thinking that man. If 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 he tells that one more time, uh, and th this was a, a pastor somewhere, um, I said, you know, I'm gonna poke my eye out, <laughs> right? Uh, and then God said, okay, that's fine. You can poke your eye out if you want, but look again. And because uh, I finally got to the place, God, is, is this is this pastor? Is there a mental block that he keeps doing that, or uh, what am I missing? That was that prayer for wisdom. Right. right. And it just blew my socks off uh, in that what that person was doing was building that muscle memory. Right. It was just as much to testify as it was for him to remember. It cemented his purpose in his mind. And by doing that, it was so cemented. It also allowed him to explore and expand when God was doing something else because he had the basic muscles so in tune because he exercised them every, every, every day. Um, and so for the difference between human knowledge and godly wisdom is the, the difference between light and darkness, right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking this guy's a little slow, right? And God says, what you're calling slow is anointed, right? He knows my wisdom. And yet I would have, if I never got to that place of humility uh, to where I stopped judging and said, God, what is up with this guy? Um, I would have never, I would have never seen it. So, you know, you, that blocks, that blocks. So what you just said, Pastor, which kind of changed my mind, is that if I'm looking at the numbers runner or the wino telling me about he's blessed because he just ran into all this money that I knew that he running numbers or selling drugs, the immediate thing that comes to mind is look at the example you're setting and you're testifying like that, you know, uh, you, why don't you live by your own words? Because like you said, I have the tendency to judge. We're saying, oh, you're the biggest scoundrel and you saying this? When actually, like you just said, that might be his in the middle of his transformation. Lord have mercy. Ooh, David, that's powerful. It's powerful. And that's the whole thing. Our first knee jerk, right, is to put something in the box of our understanding. Um, which if you, uh, you ask 9.9 9 out, 9 .9 out of 10 Christians, that's the first knee jerk. There's a contradiction there. As opposed to first saying, and that's the thing. Uh, and if, if we respond out of our human wisdom, like if I had gone up to that pastor and said, man, you know, you really need to see somebody, right? Uh, you need to see a psychologist because you repeat yourself over and over. And I don't know whether you do that, um, but it's it's kind of annoying, right? If I had gave him my, my knowledge, uh, first of all, that would have created discord, right? Second, it would have been against what God was doing, right? And so in every, when that is, and I'm adding this to the list, uh, and it goes under that uh, prayer, prayer for wisdom. Uh, that means in everything, right? As soon as my spirit is uneasy, right? Um, the tendency is to go to the knee-jerk reason and listen to our human wisdom as to why we're uneasy, right? As opposed to, God, show me the purpose of my uneasiness, right? Um, show me the purpose from your being a part of this, as opposed to me having preferences, right? Dr. Evans did a great job in saying, hey, 
you know, there will be doctrinal differences. Um, and uh, done in love, that's part of the, the diversity. But when we talk about preferences, right? My preference was for this guy to stop repeating himself. Uh, my preference may be for this drug runner uh, to stop praising God, right? For his, and putting God in the same sentence as um, uh, taking money from people that in, in my, whole, my whole worldly wisdom, right? Um, but that's from this box. The goal is to get to that place to say in everything, God, show me where my discord is coming from and show me how you might get the headline for this. In other words, show me how you, you'll be glorified. Um, and that goes back to that first, when we, when we started talking about unity within ourselves. Because we can spread this unity based on what we think as opposed to godly wisdom. All right, let's go on a little further um, as we lean into this. David, read this for me. 17, chapter 17, verse 6 through, uh, 6 through 19, and I'll put it back on the screen. Uh, I think I have it here. <clears throat> okay, all right, good deal. I have revealed you to those who you gave me out of the world. For yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by, uh, by that name you gave me. None has lost except, none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the word and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world anymore than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, that they too may truly, may be truly sanctified. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen and amen. So, so let's ask this question um, and give this brief commentary. So Jesus asked the father to protect his followers after he leaves so that they will be one. His primary hope is, here's the thing, that this is, this is at the heart of the gospel. Their primary thing, and this, this <laughs> his primary hope is not that they would be successful right? As the world defines success, that wasn't his goal. Not that they would be powerful. Not even that they would have an easy life. That wasn't primary. Rather, he wanted them to be one, even if it meant from the worldly stance they were unsuccessful, even if it went, meant from the worldly stance they were not powerful, 
even if it meant from the worldly perspective, their life was full of uh, pain, right? So with that said, why was unity among the disciples so critical in the days and weeks surrounding Jesus' death and resurrection? Well, right off the top, um, before the, the death, Judas was a disciple. Um, if the unity had been tight, I guess they would have been acting as one. And they would either have known that Judas is going astray or his mind would have changed or have been exposed because we're, we're acting as one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there, there's a connection between the changing of minds when God's people act as one. Absolutely. There's power um, uh, in that. Um, what would you add to that, Reba? So I was thinking that uh, acting acting as one and um, as that's Christ's goal, it's the opposite of Satan's goal. Because in order to have success in this world, you have to, what did I put here? And so it, they talked about having a system that's headed by Satan that keeps God out. So to be successful in this world, you have to keep God out. You have to do something outside of what he, outside of being unified with others. You just got to be for yourself and you got to find a way to separate yourself from others. So that's when we get worldly. It, so, but if we are unified with others, if we get closer, closer to what Jesus wants for us and maybe, maybe further from what this world calls success, because th what this world calls success requires us to split from others and just work for ourselves and to push God out. Wow. And so that makes me think real quick is that he, uh, Tony Evans mentioned that in first Peter or something, he talked about the father and the family. And if the family was not in, in conjunction with the father, if they were in discord, that that actually would push God away because they were dis in disunity. And that immediately brought me to the thought that you seem to raise all the time, pastor, is that 11 o'clock on uh, uh, Sunday morning is the most segregated hour. And, and if God is looking at our churches to have unity, then he's, we're pushing him away because that's the biggest example of disunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I so pray I that you... Yeah, go ahead, Reva. We become worldly when we take God out of the equation of our path to success. So it's not like we can't have a path of success, but God has to be in the equation. Yeah. <laughs> God is in the equation. Yeah. Then um, we can do that. Even, even with the 11 o'clock uh, most segregated time, that might not have been everyone's choice at the beginning, but we become pacified. Maybe that was the only way people could meet before. Um, to absolutely, worship. absolutely, and that's that is such a uh, uh, great point around the passivity of when we fall into habits, right? Uh, we know that the church was uh, segregated, right? Uh, the United Methodist Church was segregated. Um, and there was times where we couldn't worship together if we wanted to, right? right? And then as the world transforms. And I would say that is one of our biggest challenges and opportunities um, is for the church to continue to transform, right? Um, as we look around us, how is God uh, making a way for unity and not be just limited to uh, our own wisdom, but to seek, <laughs> Seek God in, in, in our uh, prayer for wisdom and even in asking the right questions. Um, 
it, and, it, and it comes down to this. At the end of the day, the unity that Jesus is praying for, he says, before I was with them, I was with you in glory, right? So Jesus comes out of God, right? Takes on human flesh to create the ability, capacity, uh, gift of eternal life, which is knowing God and knowing him. And his prayer, this is known as Jesus' priestly prayer, is that the disciples of his disciples and those disciples that will become disciples because of hearing their message, which is you and I, he says that in 17, that they may become one as we are one. So this unity is uh, the purpose of Christ's mission. It is the purpose of our existence. It is uh, uh, what success looks like. He says it so many times in so many ways, uh, all, all the way throughout the gospel, all the way throughout the Bible. Um, and you just see the devil just trying always, so whatever he can do to just uh, drive a wedge, split people, split people apart, make different factions. Um, he did it in biblical times. He does it, does it now. Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can't do anything. And we, and we can't, you know. In, you know, I always felt Jesus was the last hope. Uh, he already had come with the flood, and Tower of Babel. And <laughs> he, he had done all he was going to do. You know, he said the next time it's going to be fire. And I, I felt that Jesus was our last hope to save the world uh, from itself. You know, and when I say save from itself, it sounds so cliche, but I was looking at TV the other day. And one of the leaders in the insurrection on the Capitol uh, was an ex-Marine, a guy that lived in Arizona, had a five acre farm. And somehow they said that he was leading the charge on the Capitol. And the rumor got spread that he was a plant and that the FBI had planted him. And currently, and this was on 60 Minutes, currently he's on the run. 60 Minutes don't want to disclose where he is. He's living in a mobile home because of the people that wanted to kill him and the threats. And it made me think that the same people that he was his buddies are now the killers that want to kill him because, oh, you must have been an FBI plan. And he says he wasn't, but the power of suggestion whether he really was or not, they're ready to take kill him. He has moved from his ranch. He lost his ranch because he couldn't live there because they had too many threats. And now he's hiding out. And this is an ex-Marine, so that's not the, he's not trained for that posture. And so, so, so to add to that around this whole thing of wisdom and um, uh, to tie that to all we always have to start with the premise. Uh, in our conversations with ourselves first, right? I'm telling you that that's, look, I, if I'm disjointed and I talk to Candace, I can't give a jointed conversation from a disjointed posture, right? Hmm. So I've got to work on me first. And the way I work on that is to ask that primary question in the beginning. Uh, in my actions, in my words, where is God in the equation? I've got to start there, right? Where In what I'm getting ready to say, in what I'm getting ready to do, in what I'm thinking, where is God in the equation? And if I can't identify that with a sense of peace, that's where my prayer for wisdom starts. God, show me where you are in the equation. And yes, Jesus is our last hope. And just and uh, part of what we know from God is it always looks darkest before dawn. And even in the world, we see things that we didn't never thought would happen. What you just described from that FBI agent was one of the first people that lifted up that conspiracy theory was Tucker Carlson. 
from Fox News. And that's when uh, some of the uh, less uh, uh, pro-right uh, newscasters uh, started leaving, right? Um, but he lifted that up first and Fox kept giving him rope. And as we would have never thought it, right? They just got, they just got uh, hit with a suit finally. And we didn't know how, the world didn't know whether uh, the justice system was gonna lift, was gonna do that or not. But close to a, a billion dollars, about $750 million lawsuit uh, that was won against Fox. And as of Monday, uh, Tucker Carlson is no, they, they cut ties with Tucker Carlson, right? If you had asked a hundred folks that listened to Tucker Carlson, literally uh, uh, and uh, probably one of the most, uh, if not the most uh, midnight newscasters uh, in the country uh, that he would be let go, they would have told you no way, no how, right? Um, and, and I just say that even when it gets darkest, God always can change the game. You know, you know, Alicia and I were talking about that last night and she brought to mind some time ago, there was a radio show uh, and we said it was Orson Welles or somebody and he broadcast that we're being invaded by Martians and the, the audience went crazy. <laughs> They just believed it was real and started panicking. And, you know, it was, I guess at the beginning of the show, he said, this is fiction. But if you tuned in and missed that part, <laughs> everybody went crazy. And, you know, it's, it's almost the same thing. That Tucker Carlson, what he was spewing out there was not journalism. It was entertainment that people were taking as yes. journalism. Oh, that's a good, uh, don't miss the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I can't escape you. Uh, all right, well, friends, I pray that you have uh, a great week and uh, rest of the week and that um, you have been encouraged uh, to find God in the equation uh, because that's where we come to know God and we do that through God's word. We do that through the spirit. We do that in the application. Um, once we have determined and or asked the wisdom of God in that equation. And at the end of the day, Jesus says that this is what leads to complete joy. Not success like the world defines it. Not power like the word the world defines it. Not an easy everyday life, but to know God and the one he sent. May that be uh, your joy <laughs> in the rest of this day and the rest of this week. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Take care.